Far-right parties made big gains in European parliamentary elections this weekend, uh, rattling traditional parties in many countries. Here in Germany, the far-right AfD came in second, ahead of Chancellor Scholz's Social Democrats. In France, the far-right trounced uh, President uh, Macron. Marine Le Pen's National uh, Rally Party is now projected to take more than 30% of the nationwide ballot, more than double that of Macron's Liberal Renaissance Party. In a shock response, President Macron announced snap parliamentary elections. The streets of Paris look normal, but there's only one thing people are talking about here. The fresh parliamentary elections just called by President Macron after a surge in votes for the far right. The extreme right in Europe, Europe. I don't think that's a good thing. I'm worried. I have children and I'm worried. Okay, make uh, things clear right now and uh, we will see. And if the French decide to go for the extreme right, okay, that's the choice uh, with all the constituencies. If they want to continue on the, on the middle, uh, middle way, uh, up to the French uh, to decide. People seem to be not so worried about it. That's, that's what puzzles me as well. I mean... People that never voted far right uh, around us uh, voted far right. I think they just were fed up with uh, Emmanuel Macron. Those people delivered a battering in the European Parliament elections to Macron, handing Marine Le Pen's far right Rassemblement National a sizable win. The new poster boy of that party, 28 year old politician and TikTok star Jordan Bardella, will run to become Prime Minister in the new elections. And President Macron will have to appoint him if the far right wins the majority after two rounds of voting. The French president has been snarled up here at the Assembly since he lost his majority in 2022. Calling fresh elections is a huge political gamble, but this is a politician used to that. Back in 2017, when he won the presidential elections, he did that with a brand new party, rocking the French political establishment. Some experts say Macron operates well when the stakes are high. With Macron now back in the focus of this campaign, and maybe with a candidate that's a bit more aggressive, a bit more, let's say, popular or unpopular or well-known, to be honest, it's all to play for. But we need to wait and see what happens. And this is going to have an impact on the, the way France looks for the next couple of years. And this is going to have a big impact on the presidential elections in 2027. Macron has been continuing his engagements, like a visit of German President Frank-Walter Steinmeier to a site in France commemorating the victims of Nazi Germany. The French president knows he's about to face down one of his biggest political challenges yet. Let's see if we can uh, pick through not just uh, what happened in France, but also the wider picture of European uh, elections over the weekend with uh, Catherine Kluver Ashbrook, who is a political analyst and senior advisor at the Bertelsmann Foundation. She joins us from Stockholm. Welcome to DW. Um, starting in, in France, why would President Macron call an election in just three weeks' time when his Renaissance party has just been trounced two to one by Marine Le Pen's far-right national rally. Because he had his back against the wall, his options were either stick it out with a strong RN in, in a sort of feeling nationally emboldened, making his life even harder, which has already been quite difficult over the last months and weeks, or take this political bombshell of a gamble uh, and try to pull off a stunt that he's tried to pull off numerous times, most recently in 2019 for the presidential for, for the presidential vote, which is to try to unite the country against the sort of would-be right-wing, uh, potentially even fascist um, uh, party becoming even stronger at the heart of the parliament. Now, we've already seen today some signaling from what would be the other sort of cornerstone democratic party uh, in the uh, French parliamentary, at the French of the heart, heart of the French Republic, saying this might not work because they have been disappointed before by Macron's promises on pension reform and on others to give them a greater stake in the running of the country. So it turns out, at least 24 hours after he made that announcement, it could in fact be a very risky gamble for President Macron. Because we're talking about a national rally that's been gaining momentum. President Macron can't explain this away as a sort of midterm protest vote. No, 
Yes and no, in the sense that the European elections are often seen as by-elections on the government of the day, but you're absolutely right. The RN has been growing in its support, um, drip, drip, drip. And uh, you have to really see how much uh, Le Pen has changed the face of the party, uh, particularly over the last three years. In the French context, we call it de-demonization, meaning to say the RN has moved into the more right-wing political mainstream and has thus become become more electable uh, for a lot of Frenchmen, not just on the basis of a, of a, of a sort of a by-election, but truly on their policy ideas. And that's what makes this moment dangerous because it would open the floodgates of bringing, not unlike Hungary, a major right-wing extreme party into the heart of a European democracy. And once they get the reins of power, as we saw in Hungary and also in Poland, and they begin to make some systemic changes, those are hard to roll back in one electoral cycle. And we're talking here about parliamentary rather than presidential elections. So Emmanuel Macron is not on the, the, the ballot. So would a far right leaning parliament and a centrist president who can't stand again, is that going to mean parliamentary gridlock? Yes, likely. And that's the gamble he's willing to take. But again, look at the context in which we're operating. France and Germany are traditionally the motors, the tandem of European integration. And look at the what is brewing around the European Union. You have a presidential election in the United States that is already fraught and could bring a quasi-authoritarian uh, presidential candidate back into the White House. You have a, a coalition between Russia and China that is seemingly as the axis uh, of upheaval cementing itself and China thinking about supporting Russia in its war uh, against Ukraine. You have all manners of pressure working on the European Union at a moment when it needs to figure out its security needs and its economic competitiveness to take France out of the picture and create a lame duck situation uh, around President Macron, who won't be able to push through a fundamental agenda and get his country to fall in line. That would be a very difficult situation at the heart of Europe. OK, so let's look at, at the wider picture then. We're, we're talking about these European uh, parliamentary uh, elections. And how much does the, the, the increased presence, the rise of the far right in Europe's parliament, how much does this, this matter? What is that parliament actually good for? What is the parliament good for? I think many people who were taking to the uh, uh, election uh, or the ballot boxes yesterday were thinking the same thing. They know that big questions are a brewing for Europe. That's what we saw in the electoral participation, which was up pretty much everywhere. But they're not entirely sure what the impact of the parliament is. Now, the parliament has, over the last few years, rested a lot of decision making in the functional implementation of European legislation from the commission. The commission is the one that sort of makes the legislative proposals and then the parliament works them through and makes them palatable and functional across 27 member states of the European Union. So they're vitally important in lawmaking and in regulating the processes in the European Union and fundamentally, ideally, making all of our lives as Europeans easier. Now, it becomes a lot harder if you suddenly have obstructionist anti-European parties who can really, hmm, as we would might say, gum up the system. And in order to be commission president, which is ultimately the, one of the most powerful positions within the European Union construct, Ursula von der Leyen or any of the other candidates, but her party resoundingly won yesterday's election, the center conservatives all over Europe. Uh, she needs to put up 361 votes that will back her. And the last time around, even though her party won that time too, it was a very, very scant and skinny ballot. Only nine deputies helped her make it to that finish line. And so if the center coalition, which ostensibly is the winner still, the Democratic parties, if that coalition doesn't hold, that suddenly makes parties on their on their right wing populist spectrum, like the Brothers of Italy uh, under Prime Minister Maloney, the kingmakers. And that would give them additional power to create fractures when Europe needs unity so that it can deal with its defense spending and its defense issues and really begin to think about comprehensive security for uh, Europe, but then also make Europe much more competitive as it's being squeezed by the big power competition between the United States and China. 
Okay, made lots of, uh, of points that I think it, it was important that, to, to be made. The, the, the fact that, well, the right wing has, uh, the, the far right has risen, but the centrists are still uh, essentially uh, in charge. But, you know, it, it's only a couple of weeks since Marine Le Pen ruled her far right National Rally Party out of sitting with Germany's far right AFD in the European Parliament's Identity and Democracy grouping. So, I guess we'd be wrong to just lump Europe's far-right parties all into the same basket. No, you're absolutely right. It's worth examining whether we have right-wing populists, whether we have right-wing extremists, uh, and they fall upon a spectrum. And I will remind you, since we just talked about Viktor Orban's Fidesz party, uh, who Donald Trump, by the way, sees as the best version of statecraft, scarily enough, they have actually left the traditional groupings within the European Parliament. And so they are now free-floating. And so the question is, are the populists, the right-wing populists, going to uh, make nice with the right-wing extremists? What could be in it for them politically? Or are we going to see these right-wing movements begin to cannibalize upon one another and create uh, difficulties for themselves such that they don't actually have as much as an obstructionist effect as they might do? But getting a college of commissioners together, which is effectively the cabinet in the European Union, and beginning to set an agenda that takes the approval of the European Parliament. And if they continue to say no, Ursula von der Leyen and a potential cabinet is going to have a hard time putting itself together, creating the top jobs in Europe between now right. and even December. And again, we have an important election in the United States. You can't have Europe home and alone. A fascinating analysis. Uh, thank you for delivering that so clearly. Catherine Kluver-Ashbrook from the Bertelsmann Foundation. Thank you so much. My pleasure.